You're listening to The Frankie Files, frankiefilespodcast.com. Dr. Lois is a world-renowned expert in cultic studies, an author and co-author of critically acclaimed books on cults, and an avid contributor to the field of cultic studies through her research, presentations, and articles. PhD holder, a researcher, author, and educator specializing in self-sealing or closed systems, cults, human trafficking, situations of coercive influence and control, ideological extremism, so many big words here, (laughs) with a particular focus on recruitment, indoctrination, and methods of influence and control. She's Professor Emerita of Sociology at California State University, Chico, has been studying the social psychology of controversial groups and exploitive and abusive relationships for 30 plus years. Dr. Lalish has written and lectured extensively, has advised the international intelligence community, on extremism, indoctrination, and has served as consultant and expert witness in civil and criminal cases. Good morning, Dr. Lalish. Good morning, Frankie. It's great to be here. (laughs) I got my signed copy of Bounded Twice sitting here. (laughs) Thank you for that. The Frankie Files podcast is a mix between cult news and recovery info, sort of mixed with activism on these things going on right now and how the public can understand whole issues and thinking in religious and non-religious groups. So I thought I'd start with chatting about your books. Okay. So much to cover here. Um, Take Back Your Life, Escaping Utopia, Captive Hearts, Captive Minds, Women Under the Influence, Cults in Our Midst, Crazy Therapies, Bounded Choice, the most recent. And so my curiosity went to what your experience was with Margaret Thaler Singer, deceased in 03. How did you two meet? Uh, Well, I met Margaret um, in the, I guess it was sometime in the 90s, um, maybe the early, mid-90s. I was living in San Francisco, and I was going to the uh, American Psychiatric Association Conference, or maybe the American Psychological, I don't remember. Anyway, I was on an elevator, and she was on the elevator, and the person I was with introduced us. I had a cat pin on. At the time, I was making jewelry with my partner, among other things, and mm-hmm. she's commented on the pin and said how much she liked it, and I said, oh, well, you must be a cat person. And of course, Uh I found out she was, and that was kind of the beginning, and we became fast friends. Uh, She lived in Berkeley, and I, actually, I was living in Alameda, so not far from her, and uh, we started working together, and uh, she was, uh, she was probably in her mid-60s at that time, maybe Uh a little older, and I would have been in my 40s, I guess, or close to 50. Anyway, we started uh, working together, and I suggested she should write a book because she had lots of articles in, you know, obscure psychological journals and things like that. And I said, you know, you really need your work to be somewhere where the general public can find it. She said, well, I'll do the book if you'll write it with me. And I said, well, I'd be honored. (laughs) We wrote the first book together, <laughs> just like that. Our um, and then we wrote, the publisher asked us to write another book, and we wrote uh, Crazy Therapies. That was really a fun book for me because it wasn't about cults per se, so it was a little more removed for me. Um, right. And, and I like that about it. So, so that's. Because you're a survivor. Yeah, I'm a cult survivor. So, being able to focus on something else for a while was nice. <laughs> Mm, I do understand it so much now, six months into the podcast. It, yeah. it can be triggering, you know. Yes, exactly. So Crazy Therapies is definitely then, is it about therapies gone wrong? Yeah, it's about therapies like UFO therapy and rebirthing mm-hmm. and, you know, things like mm-hmm. that. Like some of the really, really kooky therapies that were 
really quite popular in the 90s. Um, unfortunately, <laughs> the book, I don't think it's out of print, but the problem was the publisher never put it into paperback. On my giant to-do list is, you know, to contact the publisher and find out maybe I can get the rights back and put it out myself as a paperback book. There, you know, it's it's really interesting stuff and <laughs> still applicable today. I can only imagine it's probably gotten worse, crazy therapy. Yes. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's one of my beefs with psychology is at what point are you studying a person and at what point do you stop helping them and turn into just a study of the person that may or may not hurt them? You know? Right. But a nice way for you to make some income. I mean, I know people who've been with a sure. therapist for 10 or 15 years and I think that, that doesn't sound quite right. You know, <laughs> <laughs> I'm so glad I'm not alone in criticizing because as a layman, I have sidestepped psychology completely and gone with reading about my condition. Mm -hmm. And I love it. I mean, there's material to be had. And then I don't have to simulate the Morningland experience that was like a psychologist. You talked about cults in our myths and crazy therapies. What's Take Back Your Life? My first book was Captive Hearts, Captive Minds. And I think okay. that came out in 94. And then when that publisher was going out of business, so we updated it and revised it a bit. Like we added quite a bit about children born in cults and more personal stories and things like that. Mm -hmm. And we reissued it as Take Back Your Life, you know, Recovering from Cults and Abusive Relationships. Um, mm. So that book has been selling really well since the 90s. And right now I'm in the midst of revising and updating it again because that publisher is now retiring and closing his business. Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah. So I'll be putting it out um, with a wow. colleague actually was born in a cult and has a publishing operation. So I'll be publishing it with her. And I'm adding a whole new section on the troubled teen industry horrible boarding schools and programs, you know, more contemporary personal accounts and also <laughs> revising the section for therapists, complex PTSD, which wasn't really even talked about back mm. in the past. Well, I also note that Take Back Your Life is the name of your website that you're working to offer counseling on. Yes, although that's going through some changes right now. Um, okay. And so probably what's better is if people want to know what I'm doing or learn about the courses would be for now to just go to yanyalalich.com. Actually starting a nonprofit, uh, which will be called the Lalich Center on Cults and Coercion. And then it'll be probably a couple of months till that website is up and ready. And then we'll be running the courses and everything through that. Virtually or in a location? Yeah, Zooms. Yeah, the courses have been incredible. We've had people from from Sweden, from Spain, from uh, Holland, from Canada, from Mexico, uh, Portugal. Mm -hmm. I mean, just incredible. I mean, the the value of Zoom in being able to do that is really wonderful. Yes. And as fast as you're doing it, the cults are doing it too. So, okay. Right. So then um, that's a lot for us to keep track of. So then Escaping Utopia, what is that about? Escaping Utopia is um, my book about children who were born or raised in a cult um, based on, I did something like 67, 68 interviews uh, with people who were born or raised in a cult and who, for the most part, left on their own when they were in late adolescence or early adulthood. Um, and the interviews with them were just I I have to tell you it was they were so hard to do because there was so much uh -huh. abuse and especially sexual abuse of the children uh -huh. and yep. um, most of the interviews were done over the phone because my university didn't give you the kind of money where you could travel around and do interviews in yeah. person you know you're I doing would, the NPR thing yeah right and while I you know I'd be doing the interviews and and trying to be the really 
you know, objective researcher and just say, uh huh, and yes, and the things like that. And then I would get off the phone and I would just fall on my bed and just cry and cry and cry mm -hmm. at the things that I heard. The whole issue with children raised in cults is now one of my passions because it's so yeah. many kids and there are so many suicides and, you know, people ending up living on the streets and, you know, they, they get out and sometimes they don't even know their real name. They don't have a birth certificate. They don't know how to get yeah. a driver's license or they don't know what a GED is. And they just mm -hmm. fall into one thing after another because they don't have, you know, they never learned the life skills that those of us raised in quote regular society learned and it's really troublesome that you know as a society we have no resources for those folks so yes. i was in eight to 22 i would be in that category mm -hmm. uh, so that's like one category is person born in they don't even have an, any reference to anything but the cult and then for me going in eight i barely knew the world or myself so right. it was a severe easy indoctrination when they're that young. Wow, exactly. I cannot wait to read Escaping Utopia. And I also have a pretty specific question on that later today. Mm -hmm. But then going on to women under the influence. Well, yes, women under the influence was a special issue of the Cultic Studies Journal that I was the guest editor for. I was working in the cult awareness field in the late 80s, early 90s. First of all, everything was about religious cults. And so I, I had been in a political cult. So I started giving presentations on that and kind of raising awareness that there were more than just religious cults. But also there was no special attention to women's experiences in cults. Uh, so I, you know, got approval from the editor to put together an issue about women and by women telling their stories. It is still in print, but I am okay. taking some of the material from that journal and putting it into the new version of Take Back Your Life. Remarkable studies from the slant of sociology, you know, how do groups as humans interact? It's got to be so fun for you to apply your knowledge to real life. Yeah. I mean, and that that's what's great about sociology because, I mean, not that I have anything against psychology. Uh, in fact, I kind of consider myself a social psychologist, but, you know, okay. psychology is kind of looking at the one person and like what's wrong with this one person. And there's a lot of pathologizing built into the various um, psychotherapeutic trends, um, um, whereas okay. sociology is really looking at the interactions between people and groups of people and how uh -huh. the society affects groups and how groups affect society and how groups affect the individual and so on. And so it's, it's so much more for me anyway, it's so much more about real life. I have been quite moved by many different sociologists, whereas I find um, a lack of answers for me with psychology, unless it's related to the brain, mm -hmm. specifically how we, you know, fight or flight type of studies right, and stuff like that. Exactly. Okay. So then, um, now this gets so complicated, so complicated that I had to write an article about it to try to sort it out for myself. I just learned as we had begun talking and I was reading your book and, you know, trying to schedule this interview and stuff. I learned that you interviewed the daughter of the leader of the cult I was in. Yeah. Female I, leader. I saw your post about that. <laughs> yeah. So Morningland is a church from 72 to now. And the leader died in 03. Her daughter was estranged by her. And you interviewed her while I was kind of replacing her as a trainee to the leader in my teen years. Yeah. This is crazy. Yeah. What was that like? Because I know she was completely neglected. I think what, what her interview showed, uh, as well as some of the other children of cult leaders that I interviewed, is that in most cases, they weren't really treated as special. And in many ways, they were even more neglected, quote, regular members. Uh, so yes. that was certainly the crux of her experience where, you know, she 
she was completely neglected by her mother mm -hmm. and told to get out of the way. And her mother would spend yeah. hours and hours in various sessions. And, um, and, you know, she just kind of had to make do on her own. Um, yeah. so, so interesting that you then were her quote replacement in a way. Yes. And she made a narrative up that we were, so we're these little redheaded twins. She recruited my mom and then separated us from the mom trained us as her reincarnation of the daughters of ice wow she's an egyptian connection um yeah so the propaganda was elaborate and and egyptian and new agey definitely i can't wait to read that book because i knew of her but i didn't know her yeah. and if we just took it as a matter of course that she left her regular kids why would we do that and then she was sent away, you know, she was basically sent away by her mother, um, mm -hmm. which, which she talks about in, you know, in the book. So you'll see that. You're listening to The Frankie Files, frankiefilespodcast.com. I first uh, saw you on TV on Cults and Extreme Beliefs Hulu program. Uh -huh. where you review LDS, I believe, was one of the ones you were reviewing. And what's it like trying to communicate the incredible knowledge you have, complexity of how these things happen in little sound bites for <laughs> TV? Yeah, I guess I've done so much of it that it, it really is the kind of person I am. I'm just kind of a down-home kind of person. I don't, you know, I came from a working-class background. I'm not snooty in any way. so. It's kind of my natural way to just speak in regular words and try to explain things in regular words. One particular documentary series, because there were nine episodes and, uh, and I was the consulting producer. I brought, you know, I found all the people and I helped um, mm -hmm. sort of orchestrate the interviews and make sure that people were taken care of if, you know, because it's upsetting to talk about these experiences. Oh, God, yes. Yeah. And so we, you know, we covered seven different cults. And then the last two episodes, we brought people together. We, we kept them apart in the hotel so they didn't meet each other. And then we brought them together for the first time in the last two episodes where they could uh -huh. talk to each other about their experiences and then, be, you know, see the similarities. They're like, oh, my God, we did that in my cult, but we called it X, uh -huh. you know, or whatever. And that was really a terrific experience. So, yeah, I love that series and I'm glad it's still available somewhere. Yeah, it's still on Hulu and I recommend it to any listeners who haven't seen that. Also, I'm hoping you do more. Well, I'm doing, I have a couple of documentaries coming out in the next year or so. And, okay. you know, I mean, I've constantly asked and I just turned down one because I just, I just don't have the time. I have one that I'm doing next week, actually, on the troubled teen industry. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, you do these interviews and then they often don't come out until a year later. I mean, half the time I forget. Yeah, it's definitely not as immediate as podcasting, that's right. for sure. Right. Now, um, troubled teen industry sounds like you've actually done a lot of work on that. Well, I've 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 yes, I I first went to a conference in I think it was 2012. I met a guy named Marcus Chatfield who's absolutely brilliant. I mean, he's he sort of he contacted me over the internet. And he had been with Straight Inc, which was one of the big programs um in the 80s and mm -hmm. uh, during the Reagan era. And he wanted to go to grad school. And so I wrote a letter and helped get him into grad school. And so he got his PhD and he, he wrote a great book called Institutionalized Persuasion. And then through him, I got invited to a conference by an organization called Survivors of Institutional Abuse. And it was this amazing conference on, a, on the Queen Mary, which is this old ship uh, in Long I'm Beach. I'm from Long Beach. I know yeah. it. Yeah, and it's yes. like an old Victorian ship. It's just, I mm -hmm. guess it's, I, oh, it is. Okay. So I gave the keynote speech, but also I just met so many people from so many different programs. And okay. it was a really moving experience for me. And so ever since then, I've really taken an interest in what's now called the troubled teen industry. And, and also my colleague, um, Beth Matineer, who I, have been doing the courses with, she was sent to one of those schools when she was a teen. 
So oh. she has firsthand experience with it. And so, you know, that's also kind of increased my interest. And it's very, you know, th there's a lot of crossover with, with cults. It's the same kind mm -hmm. of investigation. It's, it's actually way more yes. brutal than many cults. I mean, the, these kids are truly tortured. I mean, the physical abuse and often the mm -hmm. sexual abuse, it's unimaginable, really, when you hear their stories. And this goes on today. It's a billion, It's literally a billion dollar industry, and the healthcare, all the healthcare programs are into it and provide the money for it. And big yes. name people, politicians, all kinds of people are funding it and supporting it and talking good about it. And it's just a right. tragedy. Right. And I just wanted to mention that I recently listened to the new podcast on Synanon called oh, The Sunshine yeah. Place mm. by Team Downey. Robbie Downey Jr. and wife, I think executive producing, but what was interesting about that for me, I grew up in that time, but didn't know much about it. And, you know, they were definitely, Morningland would borrow isms from Synanon Est and other I Am and other movements. Right. But Synanon is definitely the beginning of the troubled teen industry. Yeah. Almost. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Shocking um, stuff. There are many programs that descended straight out of Synanon, um, which okay. are called CEDU programs, C-E-D-U, which it, which was his name, Charles Diederich. And so the first one was called the Charles E. Diederich University, which is CEDU. And then there's just a whole string of those. And then there's another organization called WASP, W-W-A-S-P. There's programs in that uh, lineage. And then there are the Christian programs in the uh, fundamentalist Baptist organizations, uh -huh. so the more religious schools, all of them use what came out of Synanon, which is basically attack therapy. One person is sitting in the hot seat and everyone just charges at that person and just attacks that person mercilessly. And so, and if you think that isn't painful, I had experienced that with 200 people. Yeah. And I've experienced, I experienced that in my cult only. We called it criticism, self-criticism. And, you know, it could go on for hours. And so, yeah, it's yeah. And it's very, very traumatic to the individual. And you were saying even more so than some cults, because it's like they're not even calling the parents when the teen is upset. The parents mm -hmm. thinking they're going to correct my teen. Right. I'm going to leave them there and not answer the calls. It's for the parents. Exactly. Best. You know, they tell them your kid's going to call up and make up all these stories. Don't believe them. Don't listen to them. Uh, they're not allowed to call home without someone listening in on the call. So they can go months and months and months without any contact with their families. Um, and so, the, you know, they're literally locked in. I mean, we were psychologically right. locked in in our cults, right. but, but in, the, Same. In, this, in the TTI, they are literally locked in these, these programs, right. these institutions. Uh, so you can, and, and, and often they're, you know, they're essentially kidnapped out of their beds at night. These big guys, mm -hmm. all dressed in black, come and drag them out of the bedroom, handcuff them, and take them somewhere. They have no idea where they're going. If they're 13, 14, 15 years old. You can imagine the effect that that has on you. Sociologists and psychologists are looking at it as a corrective behavior that works. How do you, as a professional who heals these types of abuses, how do you feel when someone calls it therapy? Yeah, well, that's the problem because so many of those kids who are now adults um, absolutely won't go anywhere near therapy because of what happened to them. And so it takes a long time for them to find the right person or people to work with and find the right sort of yeah. recovery tools and resources that they need. Um, yeah. It's very troubling. It does seem like it's increased. Even Paris Hilton came out and said her father sent her to one of these schools. Yes. Well, okay, can we talk about how there's so much focus on the right wing being a cult um, in politics that people oh. are not quite seeing their democratic cults too? Now, I'm speaking to someone who was in a democratic cult for 10 years, the working party. Democratic Workers' Party, I, although I would certainly say it wasn't in the least democratic. <laughs> And I see this type of behavior on both parties, but I see a lot of people saying, you know, Trump is a cult. Well, gosh, isn't the Democratic Party a little bit culty too? No. 
No, I mean, the Democratic Party is pretty wishy-washy, if you ask me. I mean, there's not <laughs> the kind of blind loyalty that we see on the right. And and the okay. thing, you know, there are certainly cults on the left. I mean, there's some that existed back when I was in my cult, and some are uh -huh. still around. There's new ones that pop up. Um, you know, I had someone in one of one of our courses who was from something called the Socialist Rifle Association or something. I mean, uh -huh. and, and most of them are very small and very ineffectual, whereas the, okay. what's happening on the right is not small and it's very effective. And, okay. and so not that we not that you shouldn't be worried if you have someone joining, you know, one of these sort of extreme left wing groups. But I think as a society, we have much more to fear from those on the right, in part because okay. they're armed and cults on the left. Um, other than back in the, you know, 70s and 80s when we had the Weather Underground, you know, that did some bombings and we had a couple of other mm -hmm. groups armed. It, yeah. the, the ones on the right, the white supremacists, the racist cults, the hate cults, some of the extreme mm -hmm. right wing stuff, you know, the, quote, patriotic groups, they're the ones who are yeah. armed and they're the ones that I believe we really need to worry about. Okay, well, thanks for setting me straight on that. I wanted to talk about Heaven's Gate, meeting the progression, the way that they conveyed their information, the way that they had a system of control in your book, Bounded Choice. They submitted their doctrine, and that formation of that doctrine is, to me, what's so under-discussed that you covered so well in the book. The deadliest cult, I think, on U.S. soil, with 39 dead in a suicide. But it is the propaganda and the formation of ideas that led them to be so obedient. Yeah. How was it to interview those and see the danger before any of these people killed themselves? What was that like for you? I had met some of the former members of the group um, who had been in a long time, who were some of the original members. And so I knew, I knew about the group. It wasn't called Heaven's Gate then. I mean, we, it, the general public called it the, the tea and dough cults because those were their names, mm -hmm. the leaders' names. So I interviewed those folks. And then I also, just in, you know, as part of my work at the time, working with a family whose daughter had gotten recruited in the 90s, in the mid-90s, they kind of went out and did another round of recruitment. They did manage to recruit a few people. And one of them was the, the daughter of this family in New York. And so I was working with them and trying to figure out, like, is there any way we could find her and get her to mm -hmm. communicate, get her to call home, et cetera. She, they were in New York. She was, last they knew, she was out in California with them. Um, you know, at some point she sent a postcard and essentially said goodbye. Um, mm -hmm. And then when the suicides happened um, and it was all over the news and I was actually the first person to figure out that it was this group. And I kept calling the police in San Diego. And of course, nobody called me back. Finally got figured out because of their website and because of the videos that they released to the, um, to right. the media. So I, had, I called that family and I had to warn them, like, be careful if you turn your TV on because you may see your daughter saying goodbye. Yeah. It was one of the hardest things I had ever done in my whole career is making that right. phone. Um, uh, yeah. You saw the ideology in its infancy and formation, and then to see it to the true right. insanity it led to. Right. I mean, it, you, you know, it really progressed over time because they always said we will never commit suicide. And then, at, you know, at the end, if you if you see the video that, that Doe, Marshall Applewhite did, you know, he did a video the night before which was released yeah. to the media. And then the next day, they all sat outside in pairs and said their goodbyes. Well, in his video, he talks about how this is not suicide. And he says, you know, it would be, it would be suicide to stay here and to do this, mm -hmm. to leave is life. And so that, you know, this is a, such a great example of how cults twist language, you know, as we call it loaded language, you know, they, they just, mm -hmm. they can take words that we use every day and give them an entirely different meaning, you know, because they had to, 
basically justify what they were doing because for 20 years they were saying, oh, we're not going to commit suicide. Don't worry. The spaceships right. come and get us, you know. And it finally got to the point where I think they were tired. They'd been waiting 20 some years, most of them. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, Apple White dying of cancer. Right. Um, and so it, when the hale Bob comet came, they just kind of latched onto that as their moment. You know, it's like, okay, let's just get it over with. But I find that many cults have this particular crossroads. And it, it's funny when I studied apocalypticism back into, you know, 1600, 700, 90, there was apocalypticism cults. And when it didn't happen, their prediction, they had to quickly think of something else. Yes. And it just seems like he literally was in an awkward position where he's got 70 or whatever at that time followers. In the end, 39 chose to make, quote, the journey. But they had been under a system of control where the other person is watching their every move and how to brush their teeth right. for so long yeah. that they were literally not thinking. Exactly. They, I mean, they were completely indoctrinated into that belief system. And one of the key elements mm -hmm. for me was the part of their belief system that taught them that they were not human beings, that they were actually aliens uh, from this other world, which they called the next level above human, right? That was their mm -hmm. parent. And they believed that they were these beings from the next level who were basically just kind of being housed in these human bodies, um, mm -hmm. which were like shells to them, which they called their vehicles. And their struggle was to get rid of all of the human emotions that were left over in that vehicle. And that was their training to get them ready to leave. Once you convince someone that they're not of this world, and then right. that person maybe thinks about leaving, how do you do that? Do you say to yourself, okay, I'm an alien being. How will anyone understand me? How will I be able to relate to that world? I'm not of that world. Really the glue, I think, uh, a big part of the glue that kept them there. You're listening to The Frankie Files, frankiefilespodcast.com. But I also wanted to make a reference to a New Age cult that's modern, Love Has One, who recently, she was dying of silver poisoning. She was administering to herself. Right. And she's stuck in the narrative that she's the mother god, mm -hmm. reincarnation, blah, blah, blah. Everybody's Jesus. How can everyone be Jesus? I've always exactly. wanted to. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> How many second comings are the second coming? <laughs> just today, I was researching for a client, and I just, just discovered another one who's Jesus. It's like, oh my goodness, there's so many. <laughs> <laughs> and, and Jesus comes in all forms, races, and genders. Yes. Everybody's yes. Jesus. You're Jesus. Yes. Sound yes. like Oprah, and you're Jesus. And you're Jesus, and you're Jesus. <laughs> you get Jesus, and you get... It's like this rhetoric has gone too far. <laughs> yeah. Speaking of Oprah, she has certainly helped it. Tell me about that section. It was so interesting because, again, you're speaking about the era I grew up in, the cult mm -hmm. we joined in 74, and New Age was everywhere. Right. I mean, people don't get it now. It was expected to be a part of a meditation group or healing or astrology, tarot, numerology, uh, aura reading. And this is what I was being trained to right. do. Channeling, channeling was a big one. Ascended beings. I mean, it, yeah, it was, you know, and, there, and it's like I say in the book, there were TV shows that were, you know, dead people right. talking and ghosts. And, you know, it was just so everybody was into crystals and wearing angels and people and it, it was everywhere you're right completely mainstream which is what's happened now and we don't think anything of it right right until i recently saw a school situation where parents were protesting meditation coming into school and i'm thinking yeah. this is interesting yeah, i would like to hear about this it's transcendental meditation yeah which is very um, corrupt organization very corrupt thank you <laughs> Thank you for saying that. I've recently heard 
cult experts saying that meditation and being in TM isn't a cult. And I'm thinking, what? No, absolutely. Oh my gosh, it's so much a cult. He said, this is the science of the brain and, you know, packaging it as a scam. Yeah, yeah. Which goes on today. Yeah, no, to, to the, the Maharshi and the people in his leadership were, were masters at that. I mean, okay. they used to get cities to pay them thousands and thousands of dollars to have a bunch of people come and meditate, which was supposed to change the crime rate. I mean, just right. like, it was like one scam after another. Right. And, the, right. and the excessive meditation that they required of their people caused so many psychological and physical problems. Um, I mean, I, you know, meditation per se is fine, but once you have to pay for a secret mantra that is the same mantra that everybody else has, you know, a lot of people say, well, I, I don't care. I'm going to go to my, I'm going to do my 20 minutes a day, okay. twice a day. But, you know, doing that and everybody, you know, knowing you do that, it, it keeps lending legitimacy to a corrupt organization. And now I learned that, you know, it has cognitive long-term effects, yes. excessive meditation and trance. Yes. What? Mm -hmm. So this foggy brain, this uh, checking out when something upsets you, this, you know, kind of spacing out on command mm -hmm. is what we're left with. And we're sold, we were sold at that time that it was amazing. You heal yourself, all this stuff. It's dangerous. We're toying with our very consciousness of ourselves. Yeah. You know, like astral travel. And I was shocked. This Leesburg uh, cult, which was a prayer group turned sexual, shocking, right? God wants you to have sex with you. Music coach and a football coach recruited these young people, teens from high school, into a prayer group. And they were teaching them how to do astral travel, Christian prayer, prayer group. How did you loop in astral travel? I'm lost. Literally no end to it. I mean, okay. I mean, I, you know, no like limit. you said in the beginning, I've been doing this for 35 some years and every week mm -hmm. I learn of new cults and new, you know, it just exploded. Mm -hmm. It's constantly exploding. Well, what's the most important thing we can do uh, as the public to raise awareness about the danger of cults, how do you want uh, people listening to you to take action? Now, I think the best thing to do is just try to educate each other. I mean, if we, it's very difficult to do any kind of education in our school systems, at least the public school systems, because mm -hmm. they think you're going to talk about someone's religion and you're going to offend someone. So it's hard to get into the schools. But mm -hmm. I think if we can do more, I think these podcasts are really helpful, People writing their stories. that just an enormous number of memoirs have come out this year. And I think people are really yeah. finally realizing that it's not stupid, weird, crazy, lazy people that get into cults. It's really, you know, cults want smart people. They want people with money. They want people who can run their businesses. That's who they're looking for. You know, if our kids are going off to college, we can you know, get them to watch some videos before they go. And um, if you sense that a friend or a relative is getting involved with something, you know, do your research and see if you can try to talk to them before they go too far in. Um, you know, it's mm -hmm. just it's difficult. But I think the more people who can understand it, um, you know, hopefully there'll, there'll be some kind of resistance. Funny because even studying propaganda in the United States, there was a, I recently found there was an international analysis group to help Americans from being propagandized. And mm -hmm. there was even a course taught in high school in the 40s uh, about this until 1942 when it was disbanded. Courses created for high school. I talk about this in one of my episodes. And it's because there is no such even cult awareness group, which my mother attended when we were still in, and she was trying to get us out. Cult awareness um, network was yeah. purchased by Scientology. Right. Oh my right. God. It was given to <laughs> That's unfair. It was given to Scientology, more or less, by the courts, which was, which was kind of like giving the NAACP to the Ku Klux Klan. I mean, it's just <laughs> it was such a trap. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And how the accomplishment this, I have no idea. 
Oh, well, they accomplished it by, they just sued, you know, they sued the Cult Awareness Network over and over and over until they mm -hmm. couldn't get any insurance anymore. And when then when the final blow came, um, they had to, they convinced the judge to have the Cult Awareness Network have an auction of all their possessions, including all their files on all the cults mm -hmm. and all the people who called them, uh, their name and their telephone number. They said, well, those are assets. They should be auctioned off as well. And then, of course, they just bought everything. Cult now owns Cult Awareness Network. Yeah. Nothing wrong with that. No big deal. Nothing to see here. Move along. Right. Um, to, to wrap up, I thought maybe you could tell us what kind of courses you offer online, how uh, to get involved in that, because I'm going to definitely be doing that. Tell us a little bit about that. Okay, so um, the courses are um, interactive. Um, they're usually five sessions, like five Saturdays in a row, or sometimes they're on Wednesdays. You know, we try to keep the enrollment to 20 so that they don't get too large. And okay. we have different, up until now, we've had different topics, like basically the fundamentals of recovery, where we go over um, my bounded choice framework in theory. We talk a mm -hmm. lot about brain trauma and the brain, um, things like that. Um, sort of what what the after effects of cult membership are, and some resources to try to manage them in your life. Triggers, all that stuff. Yeah, foundations of recovery. We have another one called healthy relationships. Basically, people have a lot of trouble, like making new relationships or whether they should keep having relationships with somebody who's still in the cult, like maybe family members, whether they mm. should have relationships with other former cult members who are out of the cult, um, relationships yeah. with people at work, like how do you talk about your experience? Do you have to talk about your experience? You know, all of that kind of stuff, which uh, people, it's a challenge for a lot of people. We had a course devoted um, just for people born or raised in a cult. We had a course for people who uh, had been sent to one of those programs in the troubled teen industry, a course called Forgiveness of Self, uh, because for a lot of people, there's a lot of guilt and shame when they get out, sort of like, why didn't I leave sooner or why did I do what I did then? Yeah, I know there's like this comedy movie about this. Um this like uh, young guy that goes to college and he thinks he's the reincarnation of uh, Leo Trotsky and stuff like that. It's a comedy movie, but I was wondering if there's something similar in the phenomenon of political cults, people that have certain delusions about their political messianic uh, mission or something like that. Yeah, I well, I think what happens is if a cult is around for a while and the leader has been able to get away with things for a long time because, you know, these are not democratic structures um, and, right. the, and there are no checks and balances on the leader and the leader is allowed to do whatever. So the, the longer the leader's able to get away with what they do and then they tend to kind of put, keep pushing the envelope. Well, let's see if I can do that. Let's see if I can push on this. Let's see if I can push on that. After a while, if they, if they, doing that for years, and especially if they are someone who's also on drugs, like Jim Jones was, then I think they do become a bit delusional. And they do think they are the, re, you know, they are the second coming or whatever. And I think in terms of political cults, the same thing can happen. I mean, my leader, even though everything she did was very conscious and very deliberate, because she was such a severe alcoholic and because she was given, was able to carry out such power abuses over the 10 years that I think by the end, she really did think she was, you know, the second coming of Lenin and was going to make the revolution. Oh, you know, wow. I mean, her name was Marlene and she used to pronounce it, um, you know, Marlene like Lenin. <laughs> so I think there is, you know, there can be a bit of that sort of psychosis that sets in. Leaders. So there's a loop. She yeah. put out an image and then she's getting it back. So she starts to believe it more too. Yeah. Yeah. I think after oh, a while they start to believe their own nonsense. Um, but yeah, you know, <laughs> yeah. I'd say, you know, 99% of them start out as con artists.
get carried away with themselves as they're, you know, they find that they have so many loyal, devoted followers and blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. um, it's working. So, <laughs> so I, I don't know if that's exactly what you were asking about, but, but that's sort of how, that's my answer on that. You've been so gracious with your time. Well, I certainly look forward to all the things you've got coming. You've honored my podcast by being here with us today. I appreciate it. Thank you, Dr. Wallace. Everyone go check out her website, J-A-N-J-A-L-A-L-I-C-H.com. Okay, thanks a lot. Bye-bye. You're listening to The Frankie Files, frankiefilespodcast.com.